Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is uh, part seven, episode number seven in a series we're doing. Uh, the topic is Heaven. And we're using this book by Randy Alcorn, titled Heaven, as the uh, guide to discuss the subject of heaven. So um, if you haven't seen the previous six episodes, they're on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, I recommend you go back and uh, watch them. We've already covered a lot of ground. We've, we've talked about heaven for 12 hours so far. <laughs> Each of these episodes is two hours long, and uh, I expect it's going to be uh, a lot more episodes before we get through this book and this topic. But before we get it, we're going to pick up where we left off, and before we do, let me introduce the panelists. we got Brother Eric here. Introduce yourself, please. Hi, guys. Uh, Brother Eric here, uh, Jesus Knight 72 on YouTube. Uh, happy and blessed to be here. Amen. Okay, thank you. Uh, hey, do you notice anything different about the, my video here? I, I changed my setting for my screen, my video here so that I'm sitting, I'm farther back. It's not zooming in so much. What do you think yeah. of that? That's better. I like that. <laughs> that I know, it seemed like I was like my face was like giant right on the screen. So <laughs> yeah, see the way you're doing now could gives you potential to maybe even wear a Christian T-shirt or something. Yeah, I mean, that's a good idea, brother. I'll, I'll have to get those out. Okay, so uh, Eric, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I've got a bunch of those Christian t-shirts, so maybe I should look, start putting them on for the show. Uh, next, we got uh, Brother Jackson. Hi there. Uh, my name is Jackson, and my YouTube channel is Mecca Wing Zero. And I love the topic of heaven. And um, last week, I recommended a book I'm reading through called Shall Never Perish Forever, about eternal security, which... Our study is on heaven, but I just want to say I'm really thankful for that truth and everything, that guarantee of actually going there and not losing and missing out and everything. Yes, very good. Yeah, I, uh, I haven't read the book, but if Jackson recommends it, then I, I feel safe in recommending it too. Thank you for joining us, brother. And uh, last but certainly not least is Brother Mitch. Right, absent in the mind and present in the body. Present <laughs> wasn't absent from the body is present from yeah, that's it. <laughs> One thing about Mitch, he brings a lot to the table here in our discussions. Uh, a lot of uh, wonderful insights on the scriptures, but uh, as you can tell already, uh, a lot of uh, humorous uh, little uh, comments. So it keeps us uh, in a in a good mood. <laughs> Of course, heaven's a topic that you should be in a good mood anyway, unless you... Be absent in the body all the time so you're present with the Lord. Heaven is a, <laughs> heaven, heaven is a great place to be. Uh, yes. Mitchell Billenkopf is my channel, and uh, you can find me on Luke's channel. Yes. Okay, so anybody watching the video, uh, if you're watching the live stream now or watching the video recorded later, uh, I hope you will subscribe to uh, all the panelists' channels. Uh, all right, we're, we've... We're on a, uh, chapter number nine now. Uh, if you have the book by Randy Alcorn, then you can pick us up, pick it up there. I guess it would be page number eighty-seven. And uh, I'm trying to go through this book and find little parts here and there to discuss. But it is almost every single thing this man writes in his book is worth discussing. So I find myself reading a little bit, and then we talk about it. So it says uh, the entire. Oh, here's this question. See, what, he, what he's doing in this book is asking a lot of questions. And it's perfect for this kind of a forum because uh, uh, he asks a question and then he gives an answer and then we give our answers. And uh, most of the time, I think we're pretty much in agreement with Randy Alcorn's viewpoint. So the question he asks is, why is Earth's redemption essential to God's plan? Uh, and to back up for a second, uh, he, he has been making the point that uh, the redemption is not only of for mankind, but it's of all of God's creation. It gets redeemed. And he's talking about the redemption of earth when, when we end up with a new heaven and a new earth and eternity. So that's the question. Why is earth's redemption, plan, redemption essential to God's plan? 
Uh, he says, the entire physical universe was created for God's glory, but humanity rebelled, and the universe fell under the weight of our sin. Yet the serpent's seduction of Adam and Eve did not catch God by surprise. He had a, in place a plan by which he would redeem mankind and all of creation from sin, corruption, and death. Just as he promises to make men and women new, he promises to renew the earth itself. Gosh, this is... It, one thing I love about his book is that it is just so rich. Uh, almost every paragraph, uh, every, almost every sentence has something interesting to discuss. Uh, so he talks about the fall of man and what happened. He says that not only did humanity uh, fall, but all, the whole universe fell under under the weight of the sin. So um, then he says that uh, God wasn't surprised by this. This interest brings up an interesting point that I, I've talked about in the past, and I'd like to get your opinion. Is if God knew that the, uh, He's omniscient, He knows everything, nothing surprises Him. Uh, uh, and, and he he is outside of time, but he can come inside time. And, and but he we see things in the linear way. You know, there's a um, a beginning timeline. Let me see where I am. A beginning timeline, and then a linear time, past, present, and future. Uh, but God is not limited to this limit, linear timeline. He can stand outside and he can watch all of it at the same time, or interact with any part of it. Uh, so God's not going to be surprised by anything. So if that's the case, and I think we all agree that is the case, then um, why did, uh, if God knew that this was going to be the plan, he'd make man, it would be perfect, but man would fall, and then he would redeem man, and we'd have this, this eternal. Uh, do you think that that was necessary, uh, inevitable? Uh, what, what's the... Can you make any sense? Why didn't he make it so that there was not going to be a fall? If there was no fall, then we wouldn't appreciate what we lost. Yeah, very related to that. What I've always thought is that he was kind of upgrading paradise, if that makes sense. Because it's true that a paradise, if he just made it and didn't allow anything bad to happen to it, would still be wonderful. But I think there's an upgrade, an additional way to enjoy it by having lost it once mm -hmm. and knowing what that's like going into the paradise. And to add to that, I'd say – to add to both those things, I think both views are correct. And um, to add to that, I think, is without the fall, um, we would have never known his true love because we wouldn't have been able to see it in what Christ did for us. We would have never had that opportunity to see how far his love went to be willing to do that for us in order to uh, bring us back to what he wanted us to be. I, I, I think you're all right. Uh, those are all valid points. But the point I was looking for and that I'm going to make is that um, uh, I, I think this applies to angels, to man, and then also in the millennium. You remember that uh, uh, scripture say in the millennium that uh, Satan will be tied up for a thousand years and then he's released. And I used to wonder, well, why would God release Satan? Now that he has them all tied up in the bottomless pit, why in the world would he release him? And I think... It, it, stick him on you. <laughs> I think that goes, goes along with the, the point I want to make here is that God uh, is love and God loves us. But uh, he wants us to love him back. That's God's desire, to have this love uh, from him and to, to him. Uh, but love uh, is not really love uh, uh, unless a person has free will to love, to, to accept or reject. In other words, if God make it, made us like uh, puppets or robots and programmed us so that we would never fall or never do anything wrong or anything, or, and it wouldn't really be love. It would just be a computer program. And uh, so I, I think that the reason uh, man had to fall is because we all are in a position where we get to choose. Do we want this relationship with God? Or are we going to reject it and say, I don't want it? 
And so after the fall, Adam and Eve had this to make this choice. Uh, the, the devil tempted them, and they, they were in a position where they chose. And they chose, no, they wanted to go their own way. Uh, and then ever since then, man has, has uh, ha had been presented with the same choice. Do we want a relationship with God, or do we want to be uh, in, in our own sovereign? And then I think the reason that uh, this happens in the millennium, where he releases the... Uh, the, the um, devil is because those people have Jesus as their king for a thousand years and there's no choice. They, the devil needs to be released so those people are in a position where they have to make a choice too. Do they want to continue their relationship with Jesus as their king or, or, or uh, now there's a choice. It's not just Jesus. You can choose Jesus or you can choose uh, the devil. That's so, an interesting oh. perspective. I, I agree, and you know something. You just brought something to, to my mind, which is it's almost like he gave us both perspectives. In the beginning, he gave us okay. I'm going to give you the opportunity. You're going to rule Earth without the Savior being there. You're going to rule it with just you. It's just going to be man. You can see how that is. Then he gave us the opportunity to be redeemed from that. Then once Christ is ruling, now those people are going to have the opportunity under the Redeemer to have that opportunity and still make a choice based on that. So it's he's giving both groups a choice. Yeah, and so I, I think you're right. I agree. I think it's a good a good perspective. If if we're related to right now, let's suppose that you could take a child. Your child is born, and you could put some kind of computer chip in the brain or perform some kind of a surgery, and he's just like a zombie, and and just he doesn't uh, uh, and but he does everything you want him to do, and you can control him like a puppet. Uh, would would that be a Receiving love from from that child, or would you be better off let the per, let the person have a chance to get to know you and decide if he lo what loves you or not? And yeah. that's that's the only really valid love is is someone has to be free to love you or free not to love you. All right, well that's uh, enough said about that. Unless uh, Jackson, you didn't say anything. Well, I'd like to say something about that. Okay. You see, my perspective on that is that although although that sounds all fine and good, the problem with that is that God is God, and he created everything. And if he created everything, he put everything in perpetual motion. So everything had to be completely and totally controlled by him. So in some respects, happily, I believe that, yes, I, I feel as free as can be. I can do what I want to do. I have a choice. I can pick up this, this, this uh, phone and put it down all I want. But to say that God does not have control over it, over it or has not planned it is to say that God is not God because God has to, has to, if he's God, not be independent of any other force. So if he created everything, every molecule, every second, everything that was going to happen, then he could not, there's no possible way that there can be randomness at all. But what God can create, God cre can create that man has a choice in inside of God's uh, God's plan and it is his love and we can realize that love through his plan but it would be impossible impossible for 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 a god who made everything time every molecule every 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 electron in the world not to have control over it now if you said that I was uh, that, that I I said look little Johnny here you go make a wind up toy and he makes the toy and he winds it up and then he has been given all of the elements in, in order for that to, to work independently, then I can say, well, then Johnny did this independently because, because what was made was made for Johnny. But when Johnny made everything or when God made everything, he made everything, every molecule, every minute, every second, every neuron of the brain and every, every interaction. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the uh, what we have to define is what is sovereignty. Uh, some people say sovereignty means God absolutely controls everything at all times. Every word that came out of Mitch's mouth, some people would say that wasn't Mitch speaking, that's God controlling every word. Uh, but uh, another way of looking at sovereignty is God has the ability to control everything. He has the power to control everything, but he does not exercise that. But he could at any point take control over anything. Yeah, I can say that that's impossible because, you see, he exercises all of his will all of the time. He can't say that I can take my hands off the wheel because he runs everything. So so he can't choose to, 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 to not control everything, but just by being God, he has to control everything. The thing is, is that he's got to give a certain amount of free will to his... 
Are you saying that you have no choice to uh, what you just said? You had no choice to say it because God made you say it? Absolutely. I have no choice, but I chose to do it because my will, I want to do it. But it doesn't feel like I don't have a choice. But it's absolutely true that God ordained everything that happens to me and everything that I do. I am a happy puppet. Although I know that everybody may disagree with that and hate that, but the truth is, is that I know that it is impossible for God not to be in control. God can't say that I'm giving up control or say that, well, I've decided not to get control to give to give control to his to his creation because create by 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 design, he designed his creation, he designed every molecule, he designed every neuron and every minute and how every synapse was going to work. Okay. Even though I, 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 I feel it. completely stringless, I am indeed, I do believe, have to be because God is in control. Okay, I'd like to hear. I'm in uh, control of everything and say, well, I let go of control. That means I'm not in control. I'm now, not Mitch, right. you do realize to be consistent, you have to say that God causes sin, too. Okay, yes. Well, let's take a look at what happened with Pharaoh. Okay, God absolutely designed what happened with Pharaoh. Okay, to come to come about is good. Yes, I do believe that. But you believe every single sin is like that, then? Because you've got to realize some horrible, horrible things. In this case, it's all God causing them and stuff. I, I do understand what you're saying about that. The problem with that is that that it is true that Joseph had been thrown into the well, but God planned it. Like the thing is, there there are people who don't have a problem, like. I read one Calvinist, I'll, I guess I'll keep it anonymous for the sake of professionalism, but I, I heard one Calvinist say that he freely and openly admits that God causes child rape and that that's comforting to him. Well, let me say this. I, I don't want to divert. I mean, we could do a, a whole series or more than that on this one question that your, uh, your position you're expressing, but I'd like to get... Uh, uh, everybody's reaction to these two two questions I'm posing. One, yeah, sorry for going off subject there. I, I apologize. Well, it wasn't off subject. It's just farther into the subject than I really want to go right now. And that is that uh, one: can there be love if if you're a puppet? If you're controlled, as Mitch is suggesting, can that be love? Uh, and the other question is: do you agree that would as I see sovereignty of God, is that God has the ability to control everything, but he does not exercise the control all the time. And then Mitch says, no, God actually is exercising control of every little thing all the time. Actually, so I, actually I said it's impossible to give up control. Okay, then I want to hear Eric's and, and uh, uh, Jackson's answer to those two questions. What was the first question? <clears throat> Well, I'll start with the second one first. Does, does God um, absolutely exercise control of every single thing, or is sovereignty that he has the ability to control anything, but he's not exercising control all the time? Uh, sovereignty to me is he has the ability, but he does not exercise control over everything. To me, it is that uh, it would insinuate that God causes me to do everything wrong that I ever do, and there's no way you'll ever get me to believe that. Um, it, it's... Um, the the idea you surrender we surrender control when we surrender to Christ um, we're surrendering control if, if to me the case would be made if if that's the case then Christ didn't die for the whole world he died for the people who were already predestined that they were already going to make it and that's not okay, what the Bible says. Question, part two of that would be then the question of love as I, as I suggested if God knew in advance uh, everything, why did this all have to happen the way it is? And I put posed the question that, well, I think that's the only way you can, uh, we can actually, God wants us to lo uh, choose to love Him. I so, I fully agree but, with with your question there, Luke. Actually, and the reason is because if you don't, because love by it seems by definition, agape in the Greek is wanting the best for somebody else. And you know there are different different types of love and different types of ways this can manifest. Because obviously, you know, obviously this whole panel wants the best for each other, but we're not we're not marrying each other. That's another kind of love and everything. And I think that I think that if God is all powerful, that means He also has the power to design a system with agents of free will that's more limited than His. If that makes sense. 
Okay. I think we have free will. I think our free will is not is, is more limited than God in that we can't we don't have the ability to do certain things like reverse the axis of the earth. But God, on the other hand, could do that. But I think God gave us a limited number of power and limited free will. You know, that to probably to accept or reject the gospel could be another manifestation of it. Although I do think sometimes there's less in will involved with that than we like to say because it's merely being convinced rather than making a big decision of I'm going to choose to do whatever. But even there, there's some free will involved with just being convinced. In other words, is the person open to the facts or not? Are they open to the truth or not? That's an act of free will right there. So I think I can stand by that statement after all. Okay, so I was, uh, the reason I brought up this, uh, this can of worms is that the, uh, the idea of the fall, uh, if God has foreknowledge and uh, is omniscient, why would this uh, be necessary? And that's the only answer that I feel is, is makes sense to me, is that uh, God wanted to give us a choice to choose to love him because that's only, it can only be loved if we have a choice. All right, let's move on. Um, it says, Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. That's Isaiah 65, 17. So we're going into a subject now where we've talked previously about how God is going to make man anew, give us a, a new glorified bodies for eternity, but now what about the earth? He says, quote, As the new heavens and the new earth that I make will endure before me, unquote, declares the Lord, so will your name and descendants endure. That's Isaiah 66, 22. So there's many references, as we'll be going through these, of um, him recreating the earth. In keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. That's Second Peter. Uh, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. That's Revelation 21, 1. Uh, first, let me ask you, uh, I know we've all studied the Bible a lot, so we're, we're familiar with this idea of a new heaven and a new earth, but what percentage of Christendom do you think has any idea that all the universe and the earth is going to be destroyed completely and, and then completely recreated? I, I like to use I don't like to use the, the term destroyed so much as renovated. I mean when they when you renovate a house and rebuild it and fix it up and make it all brand new, you don't destroy the house. You just kinda you, you, you fix what what's wrong with it. You you you, you may tear it apart to where it looks like it's been hit with a bomb, but you but 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 eventually you're building the structure, rebuilding the structure back to something brand new. So it's it's more to me like a renovation than it is like a than that. Well, I think that uh, in the book here, Randy is going to be agreeing with your premise there. Uh, okay. There's a lot of scriptures that kind of make that point that it's it's renewing it, being renewed. Right. But I, I, I'm looking at the verse, I think it's in, in Peter uh, Peter's epistle about how he uh, destroys the universe with, with a fervent fire. And, and uh, I think it says the word destroy. Uh, I, I, so, go ahead. No, no. I, I was gonna say I'd I'd like to maybe take a look, and I know that sometimes this is nitpicking, sometimes it's not, but I'd I'd like to take a look at the use of the Greek original word that was used and what what the term actually means. He maybe destroyed might not have been a very good word for that. It, it, it you know what I mean? Sometimes sometimes there's not a very good word used for the terminology it's used in Greek or or whatever was written. So it's I. I don't I don't know. I'd like to take a better look at that. Or destroyed may mean something in a different sense. Like I said, like okay. destroying the well, senses. My, my, my question is, uh, do you think that uh, very many Christians, professing Christians oh. around the world, are familiar with the idea of the new heavens and the new earth, whether it's destroyed completely or whether it's destroyed partly and renovated or recreated, whatever way you want to see it, uh, how no, many people are even affiliate associated with that kind of an idea? Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to go off, off a little bit on that. Um. No, I, I think the answer to that question is no, I don't think they do. I think they, as we talked about a few times now, I think they tend to associate it with this different place that exists that we're going to go, that's going to stay that different place forever. Mm -hmm. that they don't associate it with the same place. All right, how about uh, uh, Mitch and Jackson? Do, do you think that uh, very many Christians are familiar with this whole idea? Uh, no, I, I definitely don't. And I'm going to say something I've said before previously mm -hmm. is, I think most people, even most professing Christians, 
have not given this enough thought to even ask that question in the first place, you know. I think they think about heaven, they think about hell, and they think about some prophecy being fulfilled eventually, and that's the extent of, of the knowledge, and so I don't think they know enough to even think about the concept of will the earth always be around, or will heaven, or, mm -hmm. or all that stuff. I know I was surprised as we studied uh, uh, pre preterism in the past. Uh, we talked to some of the preterists about their viewpoint on this, and it, they don't even, they, they basically just uh, like uh, uh, make it uh, symbolize or allegorize or something, uh, the, the verse about the new heavens and the new earth and the destruction of that. They, they actually believe that uh, the earth's going to continue as it is now indefinitely. Well, and you're going to always think, have. I'm under the impression they think that this is the new earth, what we're living on, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, this is the best this is going to get, and and uh, so. Uh, but that's Mitchell. What do you think about uh, professing Christians understanding the idea that there, there's going to be new heaven and new earth? I think they just think it's all some sort of cosmic uh, dust. You know, it's just like, and it's it's not something that they, they think that they're actually going to be. It's almost like moving from on Alaska to actually on Alaska would be nice to San Diego. You know what I mean? Like, like, like you know, they don't they don't picture it as as going to a regular like actually moving to a place where the yeah. place will be nice and pet like paradise, or where there won't be problems, or, or like, like it's almost like hitting the lottery. You know, they don't see it that way. They, and, and, and this is it really loses the brain. I mean, no wonder half these Christians are walking around with no hope for anything but, well, I'll live on forever. But I don't know if they actually believe what that means. Yeah. So well, there's actually going to be happiness there. It seems that uh, we're all in agreement that this is just another of many topics we've discussed earlier about heaven where the, the, the vast majority of Christendom are totally confused and mis misunderstood and what the future holds. Okay, he says, many other passages allude to the new heavens and new earth without using those terms. Uh, God's redemptive plan climaxes not at the return of Christ, nor at, in the millennial kingdom, but on the new earth. Only then will all wrongs be made right. Only then will there be no more death, crying, or pain, Revelation uh, chapter 21. Yeah. We talked about this earlier. Remember when, when I uh, made the point of the significance of no more crying? In other words, the heaven that, that there is right now that we discussed called the intermediate heaven, there could be crying going on up there, right? Conceivably, yeah. Because they, they probably have yeah. uh, feel bad for what, what uh, the reports they're getting about the earth. And there's some cheering going on when they, they realize that someone's getting saved, especially someone they love, and they get the news, they're cheering. And other, other things, there are reports, they're probably feeling, feeling bad for the world uh, and maybe crying. But in the eternity, in the new heavens and new earth, there will be no more crying. Uh, he says, consider this. If God's plan were merely to take mankind to the present intermediate heaven, or to a heaven that was the dwelling place of spirit beings, there would be no need for new heavens and a new earth. Why refashion the stars of the heavens and the continents of the earth? God could just destroy his original creation and put it all behind him, but he won't do that. Upon creating the heavens and the earth, he called them very good. Uh, never once has he renounced his claim on what he made. He isn't going to abandon his creation. He's going to restore it. We won't go to heaven and leave earth behind. Rather, God will bring heaven and earth together into the same dimension with no wall of separation, no armed angels to guard heaven's perfection from sinful mankind. That's, uh, that's uh, Genesis 3.24. Uh, matter of fact, why don't you look that up, uh, Eric, Genesis 3.24, please. Uh, God's perfect plan is to, quote, bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. That's Ephesians 1.10. And Genesis 3.24 says, So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so in other words, he's, there's, there's not going to be a separation between paradise and earth. Earth, yeah. and, earth and paradise will be one. Uh, so this goes along with the kind of point you're making. He uses the word here, um, not restore, what was the word? Uh, refashion, re... Uh, He's restore. He says he's going to restore it. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, what do you think of this point that he's making there? That uh, if, as most Christianity believes, that we just die and we go as spirit beings into some spirit realm, why would there would be no reason? He might as well just destroy the whole universe. So there's no reason for it to even exist. If that was the case, right? Yeah, I think the way the way God originally designed creation and His purpose it reminds me a lot of um of like an upgrade of something like a like back in the day back back in like like you know the 90s and early 2000s and stuff there were shareware games that they sold on the internet. There was a fun game and everything. I'd try to get you hooked, but would say, hey, you need to register to get the full game and everything. And they would, you'd have to buy a registration code and all this stuff to get it, the full game. And I, I guess I, that's always been how I look at sort of the good things on Earth and everything. And even the good things in original creation is it's good, but it's not the full thing. And I look at God coming back and taking us to the new heaven, the new, or the new Earth, I mean, and um, it being like an upgrade, like a perfection of, rather than being something totally different that's not related. Mm -hmm. My take, my take's a little different, which is, um, why, and I understand what Jackson's saying, and I agree with him to an extent, but there's another part of that, and I think we talked about this before a couple of times. People lose sight of the fact that before the fall, God's creation was fine the way it was. It was fine. There was nothing wrong with it. This idea that the creation has to be quote unquote destroyed as it is and and, and rechanged and restored and brought remember it's being restored which means bring brought back to the original state it was when you restore a car you don't make the car into a different car you restore the car as close back to its original state it came off the assembly line as it was when god first made creation it was fine it was good everything about it was great the way it was we screwed that up. Mankind screwed that up, okay? Then it became a place that we see now, that we live in the here and the now, and we see it in the state it is now. And I think that's why people have a difficult time thinking that any of this that exists now has anything to do with the future, because this all has to go away. No, it doesn't. It was fine the way it was prior to the fall. It was fine. Now it's got to be fixed from the damage that's been done, restored like, like an old vintage car. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, but but not restored as it originally was. Restored as it originally was, and then as uh, Jackson said, with all kinds of upgrades. Right, right, exactly. And then 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 Jackson's upgrades come along with that. Because and, and and these upgrades may have been, you know, part of the whole the intention all along. I mean, they've just been upgrades that would have eventually come down the road anyway. But we but we started off in this it in one state. It would have who knows it may have changed in. Um, and been something quite different sooner. So you know, these upgrades might have happened sooner. Uh, on second thought, though, maybe they're not upgrades of the original paradise, but they're just upgrades of this fallen state. I would actually think that they're upgrades of the original paradise. Mm -hmm. But that may be, I, that may be because um, I, I, I believe that human death came through the fall. I don't think that's where animal death came from. Well, here's here's another thing that I would agree with Jackson. Not so much the animal thing, but the idea that God's holy city at that time didn't dwell on the earth. It, it wasn't there, even though it was paradise and it was made the way it was. It implies that even with that original state, there were upgrades. Eventually, that was going to be the case. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Maybe uh, like a, a butterfly, more like a chrysalis. Okay, yeah, that's fair enough. It, start, it starts off in one in one way and morphs into something else, sure, yeah. See, I guess the way I think about it is I do think, obviously, it was very good and there was no sin before Adam and everything, but I've always thought, and maybe, maybe we could examine some scripture on this, maybe Randy will talk about this, but I've always thought 
since God knew that the fall was going to happen and everything, he planned accordingly for it when he made the earth and everything. In other words, he knew that eventually we'd be moving on to the new earth beforehand, so he made a very good paradise. I don't think it says, and God saw that it was perfect after he had made. He just says that God saw that it was very good, which I've, yeah. I've done some research on that Hebrew word, and I don't think it means perfect there. Okay. I think it does mean perfect in some sense. Uh, he says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God. I think in that, in that case it refers to perfect. Right. God is perfect. Right, right, but that's the Greek New Testament. I'm talking about just the word that says very good in the Hebrew in Genesis. Okay. All right. Um, and he's, he goes on to say, God has never given up on his original creation, yet somehow we've managed to overlook an entire biblical vocabulary that makes this point clear. Uh, words such as reconcile, redeem, restore, recover, return, renew, regenerate, resurrect. Each of these biblical words begins with the prefix, with the RE prefix, suggesting a return to an original condition that was ruined or lost. Uh, many are translations of Greek words with an ANA prefix, which has the same meaning as the English RE. For example, redemption uh, means to buy back what was formerly owned. Similarly, reconciliation means the restoration or reestablishment of a prior friendship or unity. Renewal means to make new again, restoring to an original state. Resurrection means becoming physically alive again after death. That's interesting, the, the RE prefix, isn't it? Well, I think you're seeing a little bit of what we talked about. You're seeing both things happen. Like we talk about our bodies as well. We're going to receive new bodies, which in a sense are our bodies, but there's still something even better than that. There, so, so you have that. Too. You have both things happening here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've often thought about uh, you know burial and your body is rotting the grave versus let's say cremation or particularly cremation, and then your your ashes are thrown into a river and it's dispersed and you know, uh, how can you have your body back? But, but God can very easily take every molecule that was in my body and t pull those molecules from wherever they are all around the world, if that's the case, Absolutely. and pull every one of those original molecules back into place how he, how he wants it to be. Absolutely. It's, and that's what we talked about earlier. You're, it, it's only breaking down on a molecular level. You're, we're seeing it physically as people, but all the molecules and the pieces are still there. It's not created or destroyed in that essence. It's, it's, it's there. It's just in a different state. Yeah. And I also see as, as, as we are advancing with science and technology and stuff, the, the, the amazing things that we're able to do now, man just figuring this out, and we, we understand these different dimensions and these... Uh, uh, fractals and all this stuff, that we, and, we, and we just, Einstein said, we don't know 1% of nothing. So uh, uh, we, it seems like we understand a lot, but there's so much that we don't know that uh, uh, it makes me under, uh, believe even more that, well, we're we can, getting a little bit of glimpse of how God has, has uh, formed everything, and he could very easily, just like, going on this uh, keyboard here, typing a couple of things, and, and then something comes up on the screen, and he could just will it or speak it, and all of a sudden all the molecules are moved in place. <laughs> hey, these words emphasize that God always sees us in light of what he intended us to be, and he always seeks to restore us to that design. Likewise, he sees the earth in terms of what he intended it to be, and he seeks to restore it to its original design. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we've already talked a lot about how our bodies will be restored. Uh, now we're focusing on why is it necessary that the earth be restored. Uh, he says, religion professor Albert Walters in Creation Regained writes, quote, God hangs on to his fallen original creation and salvages it. He refuses to abandon the work of his hands. In fact, he sacrifices his own son to save his original project, humankind, which has botched its original mandate, and the whole creation along with it, is given another chance in Christ, 
we are reinstated as God's managers on earth. The original good creation is to be restored, unquote. Hmm. Yeah, so um, I, I think that this is the beginning. Of course, I've read the book and uh, um, years back, and, and I'm, I'm rereading it again before we, uh, as we go through it. Uh, and I know that uh, the idea of uh, the original is not going to be completely discarded and just starting from scratch. No, he's going to bring back the original, restore it, but make it even better. And that applies not just to our bodies, but to the earth and all of creation. I'd like to make the point that restoration and upgrade, for anyone watching this, are not mutually exclusive to each other. For example, if I'm restoring a car, if I'm restoring an old Camaro or whatever, I can paint it the same color that it was and fix all the broken parts, but I may also put a better engine in that gets better gas mileage than what was before, it was faster than before. And I may, it may have leather seats and I might get a higher quality brand of leather in there that's the same color and everything. So I, I think just in case there's any confusion, there's no need that these two things are mutually exclusive to it, be mutually exclusive to each other. Yeah, yeah it's sort of like the... It's, it's sort of like the car a, on Back to the Future. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or, or, you know, it's funny. I'm glad Jackson said that because that's kind of what I was talking about with the restoration of the car. It's funny he said that because in a lot of those restorations, they do take the cars. I've been watching a lot of restoration shows, and I love it. I love to see them take these old cars and bring them back to life. And oftentimes, they give them a brand new engine with chrome and all this other. So, yeah, it's the combination of restoring with upgrades. So it's like they, they don't have to be separate. Absolutely, Jackson's absolutely right. They don't have to be separate. These things come to get, can come together. <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you restore an old car and make it just like it was, and then you put in some modern technology to so you have a really good sound system and, and maybe a, uh, you know, some computer technology uh, built into it too, you know, you've restored it, but you've also enhanced it and improved mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So he says, uh, if God had wanted to consign us to hell and start over, he could have. Uh, he could have made a new Adam and Eve and sent the old ones to hell, but he didn't. Instead, he chose to redeem what he started with, the heavens, the earth, and mankind, to bring them back to his original purpose. God is the ultimate salvage artist. He loves to restore things to their original condition and make them even better. God's purpose in our salvation is reflected in a phrase from the hymn, Hallelujah, what a Savior. Um, it goes, quote, ruined sinners to reclaim, unquote. Reclaim is another R-E word, with that re, with prefix R-E. It recognizes that God had a prior claim on humanity that was temporarily lost, but is fully restored and taken to a new level in Christ. Quote, the earth is, is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. That's Psalm 24. God has never surrendered his title to the earth. He owns it, and he will not relinquish it to his enemies. Hmm. Okay, so this is just more of the making the point. Uh, when Randy wants to make a point, I mean, he, he backs it up with a lot of different uh, ways of expressing it. It's, you know, you can make the same point, but you can make it maybe... 5, 10, 20 different ways, but you're still proving the same point no matter how you're expressing it. Um, so I think the thing to understand is that, yeah, he's not going to, like, uh, what do you think of the idea what he, 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 he made there or posed it in the question? Uh, could God have just said, okay, uh, I'm just going to just, all after the fall, and let's say, let's say today, man, he just decided just destroy of all mankind and, and no one gets saved, and the universe destroyed, and just start all over. He could have done that if he wanted to, but it seems God doesn't want to discard it and throw it all away. He wants to re re restore it and reclaim it. I think God could have done it any way he wanted to do it, but he decided to do it that way. Sort of like. And, and, and the reason. The reason why I would imagine he decided to do it that way, and I agree with Mitch there, is 
like going back to the car analogy again, is I would feel really uh, great about an old, uh, an old Camaro that I restored because that, that would just, the fact that I restored it and put that much time in it would help me enjoy it even more. And I wonder if it's not similar for God. <laughs> well, I'm wondering also that if Adam and Eve hadn't fallen, would it have been the same? Sure, he could have just made it the way it was, but for the purposes of, of falling, for, to help us appreciate what we're going to have, if he hadn't added that ingredient, then would, would heaven have been the same as the garden, back to square one, where Satan could come in and say, well, you don't know, you know, here's this fruit, of the knowledge of good and evil, because you haven't eaten of it yet, so you don't know what it's like to lose what you had. So, so in other words, without that ingredient of them falling, heaven would not be exactly the same. Uh, you know, heaven would be exactly the same as what they were in in the garden. Mm -hmm. So, so I believe that he had he did it that way on purpose, so as that when the glory of heaven comes, it's all that much more glorious. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that uh, both of those points are, are valid in my mind. That uh, as Jackson said that. Uh, uh, you really would enjoy it. Uh, God would enjoy restoring it because, it's like, just like we would enjoy, enjoy restoring something. But, uh, but on our, from our perspective, we will appreciate it more, knowing that we were, we've been restored and we were lost, but now we're, we're restored. Gives us perspective. Uh, he says it's impossible to understand the ministry of Christ without the larger view of redemption's sweeping salvage plan. Quote, it is particularly striking, unquote, writes Albert Walters, quote, that all of Jesus' miracles, with one exception of the cursing of the fig tree, are miracles of restoration, restoration to health, restoration to life, restoration to freedom uh, from demonic possession. Jesus' miracles provide us with a sample of the meaning of redemption, a freeing of creation from the shackles of sin and evil, and a reinstatement of cre creaturely living as intended by God. Uh, I, I don't know. I think that I, I, I thought of another exception. He said the one exception is the, uh, uh, what, what did he say the exception was? The fig tree. Okay, he destroyed the fig tree, but I think another one is not restoration, is just feeding, feeding the multitude. I, uh, he just uh, made fishes and loaves just appear, and, and also with the wine. I don't think that was an example. So I don't think that this quote here is completely correct as far as his conclusion. There's more than one exception uh, in Jesus' miracles. Do you, you agree with that? Sure. Okay. Um, God placed mankind on earth to fill it, rule it, and develop it to God's glory. But that plan has never been fulfilled. Should we therefore conclude that God's plan was ill-conceived, thwarted, or abandoned? No. These conclusions do not fit the character of an all-knowing, all-wise, sovereign God. God determined from the beginning that, we will redeem, that he will redeem mankind and restore the earth. Why? So, this, so his original plan will be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that gets back to the question of, uh, you know, was his plan ill-conceived? <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't think his plan was ill-conceived. Uh, uh, no matter how you, how you look at it, uh, I mean, some people are going to say, well, gee, he must have failed. That's why, he, that's why man fell. Man fell, but. Uh, scripture shows us God's purpose with remarkable clarity, yet for many years as a Bible student and later as a professor, I did not think in terms of renewal and restoration. Instead, I believed God was going to destroy the earth, abandon his original design and plan, and start over by implementing a new plan in an unearthly heaven. Only in the past 15 years have my eyes been opened to what Scripture has said all along. Now that's that's Randy Alcorn expressing that, saying that as a pastor and professor, as early as 15 years before he wrote this book, he had this false understanding that there was no restoration of the heavens and the earth and new creation that we're just going to exist in some spirit realm. That's pretty amazing. 
it's almost to me it's 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 almost a, an it's an extreme example just like um, uh, you, you, there are these authors who were they they were atheists and they decided to prove uh, th there's no God and the Bible's wrong and they that was their mission so they started studying and researching and trying to uh, to prove the Bible wrong and uh, uh, many of these people have ended up writing books uh, as apologists proving the Bible because they they by trying to prove it wrong they became convinced that it was it was right 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 like if one 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 person I know is Hugh Ross did that and you can watch his testimony on YouTube and everything yeah, uh, and you've got uh, uh, Josh McDowell's another example, uh, and then another one that did uh, he did several books called uh, The Case for Christ, The Case for Faith. Uh, what's his name? Strobel, Lee Strobel. Right, Strobel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's it's really amazing how some of the, the most the, the greatest apologists we have today, their original intent was to prove the Bible wrong, and then they became pastors and evangel uh, uh, you know writers and uh, biblical apologists mm -hmm. instead and this is the same kind of a thing as uh, here is a guy that was his his understanding of uh, eternity was so wrong even as early as 15 years before he wrote this book but by doing the research on it he, he understood that hey scriptures tells us a lot about eternity and and the, the church's idea of it generally is very very wrong yeah, and you, you know, this is true about a number of subjects. For example, a lot of people don't understand the judgment seat of Christ versus the great white throne. Some think that believers won't go through any judgment. Others think we all stand before the great white throne. Both of those are absurd biblically, but that's a subject I understand a little bit more why people would be confused about because it's not something that comes up all the time. You'd think the very thing the gospel is promising heaven would be something people study and have a grasp on and everything but it's not and that's what we keep on saying you know it's it, the, the, the example about the great white throne and judgment seat that's something I'm not that surprised people don't really have a grasp on that but this you would think that this is what they'd be teaching in churches and everything yeah now again the, the, when you talk about it in terms of soteriology you've got um, uh, the question, what must I do to be saved? Well, obviously, the question implies you, you there's a you're in danger, a ri you're at risk for something bad, and you need to be saved from it. And this is called the uh, second death in the lake of fire. You need to be saved from that. So, uh, uh, th th with that emphasis, it's all about being saved from that um, uh, that bad uh, outcome. Uh, but the other perspective would be instead of what must I do to be saved is uh, what do I need to do to receive the gift of eternal life the gift of eternal life uh, and uh, if you look at it from that perspective you're more likely to think the gift of eternal life well that, that's going to be more focusing on, on heaven I just don't think, think that people have a vision. I don't think that a lot of people don't even believe. I really think that they don't. I don't think that they, you know, they, they would be more inclined if, if a family member, like, a, like a, a parent or a grandparent died, to be in the grandparent's house, you know, scoping out all the grandparent's goods, you know, checking out, <laughs> checking out what they're going to inherit from, you know, a house, land, property, than they would to, to, to think about, the land and property that are, and what they're going to be given in heaven, because that's on earth. They can't believe that. I really think that they have no. They're blind. They don't have any vision for heaven. Mm -hmm. I, I I agree with Mitch. I think he's absolutely right. I think I think we get into a deeper issue of belief here. I think we're talking about, you know, you have to look in deep inside yourself and ask yourself, what do you really believe? I mean, I mean, if if if, the, if these things seem ridiculous to you, what else what else really underlying seems ridiculous to you in scripture? Because mm -hmm. If you don't believe for this reason, for eternity, because this life is a shred of a percentage of a fraction of a small part, that then what are you what are you preparing for? What 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 are you what are you looking forward to? I mean, yeah. Well, here, here's the other thing too: is the thing that's that's striking is even amongst I think saved, born again Christians, how much ignorance there is about about heaven. Actually, like. 
I know I don't know that much about. It. I mean, obviously, I'm learning. That's why I'm here and everything. But I could tell you a lot more about like all seven, all, all yeah, seven dispensations than I could about heaven and stuff, which is it's which is kind of interesting. So, yeah. Well, we've said it before. We're probably going to say it a hundred times more before we're finished with this topic, and it uh, <clears throat> this subject has has been seriously neglected by the church. Uh, what lies behind our notion that God is going to destroy the earth and be done with it? Um, I believe it's a weak theology of God, though we'd uh, never say it uh, this way. We seem we see him as a thwarted inventor whose creation failed. Having realized his mistake, he'll end up trashing most of what he made. His consolation for a failed earth is that he rescues a few of us from the fire, but this idea is emphatically refuted by Scripture. God has a magnificent plan, and he will not surrender earth to the trash heap. Yeah. This is all, again, just making the point that uh, uh, even though it's going to be, uh, you know, burnt up with fire, it's not going to be, like, completely trashed and discarded. It will be wiped clean, maybe purified. Maybe, you know, the, what do they call the fire? Fire is a pur purifying fire. Maybe he's going to purify the whole universe with fire, <laughs> you know, and maybe that's the type of fire that we're going to have in the universe. Yeah. Uh, he says, um, as Walt, Walter says, quote, the redemption is not a matter of an addition to a spiritual or supernatural dimension to creaturely life that was lacking before. Rather, it is a matter of bringing new life and vitality to what was there all along. The only thing redemption adds that is not included in the creation is the remedy for sin. And that remedy is brought in solely for the purpose of recovering a sinless creation. Grace restores nature, making it whole once more. Yeah. Well, he's going to talk a lot about you know how not only this grace and this resurrection and restoration is not only for man, but for all of creation, uh, and. Uh, I don't know. I've never really given a whole lot of thought and tried to figure it all out. But uh, you know, when when sin came into the world, and this is another thing that I know Jackson. We don't got to get sidetracked too far off this. I know you. I think you said that you're a, a an old earther instead of a young earther. Oh, he he left a message saying he's going to be right back. He might have stepped away. Oh, okay. Well, if if someone's an old earther and instead of a new earther. Uh, uh, if they believe that there was no life on Earth, I could see how maybe that would could not conflict conflict with uh, uh, sin coming into the world and, and then therefore death. Uh, but uh, only with a new Earth viewpoint can I see that uh, uh, death came into the world because of sin. Because you you would have to have uh, uh, if it's an old Earth and you had got man created last after thousands of years, say. Uh, and you must have had animals and so on dying all those all those uh, through that whole time frame, and therefore sin would not have caused the fall of the earth and, and life and, and caused death. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So um, my my point is that this man's fall obviously we we know that it didn't just affect mankind; it affected every living creature. Mm -hmm. And it even affected all the matter, and I guess not only on Earth, but the matter of the whole universe. Isn't that amazing that, that it is. mankind, when you think of, of how tiny uh, the Earth is in, in, the, in this uh, galaxy, and then, I mean in this uh, uh, solar system, and then the galaxy, and then all the, the whole universe, it's such a speck. It probably is not equal to like one grain of sand out of all the beaches in the in the uh, on the earth, and yet you have these two people that God created affecting all of the universe mm -hmm. by this by this act of rebellion. Mm -hmm. Isn't that isn't that amazing? The impact of that. Yeah, I think I think it speaks volumes to to 
to people as far as to how powerful a thing sin is and how influential it is and how quickly it works. It 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 literally is like a disease. It infests and and uh, <laughs> eats away at everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like if you think of uh, uh, mankind on the Earth, and then the Earth within the the solar system, so on. If we were just molecules inside my body, let's say that my body represented the universe, and different places in my body were different so solar systems, and then so on. That that uh, if you get disease and it spreads to the whole body. Mm -hmm. So the disease started here on Earth through the fall of man. It just spread through the whole body of the universe. Mm -hmm. Well, at least I understood it. <laughs> no, I, I think it's okay, uh, absolutely right. Okay, uh, he says the new Earth is the old Earth restored. Uh, Peter preached that Christ quote must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets, unquote. That's Acts 3.21. We're told that the time is coming when God will restore everything. This is an inclusive promise. It encompasses far more than God merely restoring disembodied people to fellowship in a spirit realm. Because living in a spirit realm is not what humans were made for and once enjoyed. It would not qualify as restoring. I underlined that in the book because I think that's a very profound statement. Uh, you're not restoring. I think he's gonna. I think he's about to clone himself. <laughs> yeah. Maybe he was raptured. <laughs> oh no, we're still here. <laughs> we weren't, you know. Uh, well, I guess we're the unlucky. What does that say about us? Oh no. <laughs> what? Now he's frozen. Yeah, he'll he'll. Oh keep... oh oh! This is the cloning himself thing. Yeah, it always happens yeah, with his glasses. Yeah, I've only seen it happen one time. Well, I've seen it once without this, the glasses. But so far, your theory stands true, Jackson. He's, he it happened again while he's wearing his glasses. And you know what? The one time it happened when he wasn't wearing glasses is when it was off air. So maybe there's 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 some scientific thing behind it being live and freezing with glasses. Because probably he's blind when he was not just. <laughs> within windows a lot and stuff and his glasses on he's really trying to focus and see it and everything that's probably what it is and then <laughs> there yeah, he is there you go this time before you touch something put your glasses on first yeah. <laughs> I was having a great conversation with my book myself in this book and you guys I have no idea how much you missed <laughs> what was the last word you said do you remember uh, well the, the point I was trying to make here, I underlined this, it says, living in a spirit realm is not what humans were made for and once enjoyed. It would not qualify as restoring. So, um, yeah, if we're going to be restored, that means we have to be restored to what we were, not just becoming, just existing as spirits in a spirit realm called heaven. I want my body in heaven. I want... I want, I want, you know, comfort. I want, I want couches. You know, I want, I want tables and chairs and and steak. You know. I want um, drive-in movie theaters, techno music, and a red Camaro. Uh -huh. If you haven't noticed, I like red Camaros a lot. Which year? Do you like the '74 SS? The new ones they make are a lot like them. Yeah, I actually like the new, the 2010 model is the fav my favorite that I've seen, but I'd be open to a classic, too. See, I, li I like the old 65s. Yeah. I like the new kind of more high-tech look. And look, Luke got frozen with the, or did he? No, no, he's good. He's just listening to our talk no, about the Luke was staying pretty still for a few seconds there. That was interesting. <laughs> that well, was interesting. I'm trying to just listen for a moment. Yeah. I actually like the Dodge Challenger, to tell you the truth. Even the yeah, that's sweet. That's a sweet car. It's a sweet Very nice. car. Very nice. The Corvette would be um, nice, too. 
but in getting back to what, what Luke was saying, um, I mean that makes that does make perfect sense. And we go back to the original point we made. We made this several episodes ago, where we said and we we told people, look, when we were first made, we weren't made as spirit beings to live in the spirit world. God made our bodies and then filled those bodies with spirit. We 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 weren't we were made to be physical. And I think Mitch. Mitch is, you know, he's he he's facetious about things, but at the same time, it's it, it's tr what he's saying is true. I agree wholeheartedly with him. I want to be able to enjoy things a better way than I could even enjoy them now. Uh, hey, a good couch, a steak, a, you know, whatever it might be, a car or whatever. I mean, if we experience those things now, and that's what we go through life experiencing food, um, a, a, a swim in beautiful water, uh, the beach, the you know this. You know, um, good. You know, what's the point? I mean, what's the point if you don't get to enjoy that in the format you're supposed to enjoy it in a much in a much better way, a renewed way, and and then as we talked about, Jackson used the word upgraded, an upgraded way. Yeah. I mean, well, that's the whole point think, to me. Here's what I think part of people's problem is. I think that you know how we talked about Gnosticism and the idea that spiritual is bad and physical, yes. or, or, spiritual is good and physical is bad. I spoke yes. there. What I'm saying, what I think the main reason for that people view it that way, because obviously I don't think people are thinking, hmm, I'm going to think back to Gnosticism and agree with it. But I think the reason the Gnosticism point of view has caught on and everything is because of uh, a scientific law called entropy. You know, the thing in physical things is everything goes toward the disorder rather than the order. If you don't dust, your, your desk is going to get super dusty, you know. Our bodies are slowly dying right now, even. Yeah, but that, and, that, um, that speaks more to the results of, you were seeing the result of sin. Well, well yes. That's why, you know, that's why yes, we have entropy. Yes, we are, but that's not what people are thinking. They're thinking, right. oh, just, this is physical and this is scientific and everything, and therefore in heaven... You know, there won't be all this erosion and everything, so it must not be physical. But the, that the faulty assumption there is the idea that physicality has to have entropy. Yeah, I think true. I agree with that. I think you're right. Uh, I think people. I've asked that. myself that question also, uh, Jackson. Is is uh, will there be entropy in eternity? Um, I don't know. There either. I guess there either will not be entropy, uh, or there will be entropy, but somehow uh, we're not going to be harmed by it. I'd say we would re regenerate so fast, like we regenerate now. So, yeah. well, so then, and then you have to you have to ask yourself, what is entropy exactly? You know, I mean, for example, sometimes it has natural laws where things will biodegrade or something like that. So there could only there could maybe only be entropy that has a positive effect. Mm -hmm. Certainly, there won't be this you know slowly dying diseases um, and and that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I thought... Smoking a cigar in heaven would probably be healthy for you. That, you know, <laughs> That'd be great. You know? Oh, and, so and eating, oh and, yeah. yeah so I, I like I, well, the occasional uh, cigar. <laughs> e eating the sour, um, like, like goose candy wouldn't rot your teeth either. Yeah, exactly. Right. I've always yeah, loved that. Yeah, yeah, I like my Austin. And my take was... Hey, guys, how you doing? Hey, Austin. Austin, Welcome. I apologize for my, uh, I missed kind of by an hour, come in a little later. There's no need for apology. Yeah, it's about heaven, can't be that bad, right? Yeah, yeah you know, you know. Yeah, we're talking about, we're, right now we're talking about um, the negativity that people often associate with physicality, regardless of, and, and assuming that entropy has to go with it, or that sin and disease have to go with it. Yeah, I want to I want to add to what uh, Mitch was saying about uh, the um, how we heal. For example, if you get a cut, we know that we heal. What was the word you used, or Mitch? Uh, we, we regenerate. regenerate. We regenerate. We, we rege re our, our flesh regenerates. It heals, and maybe there's a scar or something, but it heals, and we know that if you were to do time-lapsed uh, photography and watch someone's cut, a, a, a cut on their arm, and watch the healing process, you'd see over the period of, of days and weeks uh, this healing going on. But as Mitch said, maybe this process will be much, much faster, maybe it's instantaneous. And when I used to watch those movies about uh, werewolves, or, or, or let's say yeah. vampires or something, and they get stabbed or something and, and, and within seconds, 
seconds, the, the wounds are all healed up. And uh, I'm saying, well, that is, to me, I don't find that uh, hard to believe at all because we do it. All, all they did it in the movie was he did it at a much faster rate. And so maybe in eternity, Mitch is correct, we get injured or something and it's instantly healed. That would be cool. Yeah, I think so. You could, like, throw me off of buildings, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I could, like, yeah. do evil can evil and, like, make jumps and miss. <laughs> the Grand Canyon is ten feet bigger now, and I, I I messed it up on the motorcycle. Well, there's well there's there's only there's only two real options. That that's one option where there simply is no injury. It there, there simply is none. You, you can't be injured. I mean it's 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 uh, one of the things I I always brought up um, with people. I said I wonder if you'd be able to just simply breathe underwater because you can't drown. So I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if you could just go to the deepest depths of the ocean to see some of the most amazing things in the deepest depths of the ocean and swim with different animals in the ocean, things like that, and not have to worry about drowning because you don't, you can't drown. I mean, yeah, it's, I wonder if there'll be any type of fear in heaven whatsoever. I, I would say, I would say, yeah. oh man, I do one of those, one of those Dave videos. I cut my arm off. Oh, oh look at that! Now <laughs> wouldn't even feel it. My finger will grow back. Oh man! Can't <laughs> take this out. Ooh. Uh, About the ocean, I, I hate salt water. I, I may have my eyes open in water, but man, salt water just irritates the flip out of my eyes. <laughs> It'll be sugar water. But see, but yeah, it, it won't it won't, won't yeah. hurt your eyes. It won't hurt your eyes. Well, you know, we early uh, previous episodes we talked about the people who are in this uh, intermediate heaven right now, and uh, do they have bodies, uh, some temporary physical existence, or or not? We talked about that and. Uh, but we do know that there's at least uh, one person in heaven that has a physical body, and that's Jesus is resurrected and he ascended with a physical body into into heaven. Mm -hmm. So, if we're assuming that he has that physical body there now, then is there is there an environment up there with oxygen where he breathes, or does he not have to breathe? And these are the kinds of questions that we would we could ask about everybody else up in heaven. If they do have some kind of bodies, is it necessary for them to breathe? Or as, as Eric said, can you just go underwater and hold your breath or not have the need to breathe? Did Elijah, when he went, did he have a physical body? Yes, he did. Elijah, Enoch, and Jesus were ta were uh, taken up with physical bodies. That's why I think that they're actually building the new heaven and new earth. When we're in the, we'll be in the intermediate place. They'll already be there. They're hired hands. Jesus is like working with Enoch. Enoch's like, yeah, go over there and build that that pillar up there. <laughs> <laughs> well, what it did, uh, real fast. What did Jesus do when he resurrected? And uh, at first, somebody saw him, but. They couldn't recognize him. He, he didn't change bodies, right? He just disguised himself, or did he put like a, a spirit over them that they couldn't see? What was that? Well, it's, it just it just mentions that they didn't recognize him at first, and I, I tend to think it's a couple of things. Number one, that when we receive a, a resurrected body at Christ's point where he received a resurrected body, he did look a little different. And you have to remember, these people just saw Jesus – Beaten, bloody, I mean, marred in such a way beyond recognition that to see him walking around would be utterly ridiculous. They, they couldn't believe it would be him. So they wouldn't, at first glance, you wouldn't believe it was him because you just saw him. Here you saw him hanging on the cross, whipped. Uh, uh, he, he's just bloodied beyond any kind of recognition of the person that he was. And to see this person, I, I think that's most of the reason why they didn't recognize him because they weren't looking for him, really. <laughs> and the second reason is because maybe he did in his resurrected body looks looks slightly different. Maybe he did look slightly different. Yeah, well, I look at the road to, to, to Amos, the two, the, the, the two travelers that were traveling with him on the road, and they didn't recognize him, but they spoke about him. I think that there may be a spiritual meaning here that when Christ reveals himself, he reveals himself. And that 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 you know he you uh, he gives the, he he first first he has you talk about it, sort of like we're talking about heaven, and we talk about all the things and 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 then didn't we have a great time talking about these wonderful things, wanting him and then Christ supping with them and then appearing to them and then disappearing. Yeah, I, now I think in that instance, I think there's different instances there. I think what Mitch is saying is true in that instance. Yeah, it was more of kind of a spiritual thing. It was their eyes were kind of open. Mitch made a great um, a great comment earlier about people being blinded. The Bible says they have scales over their eyes. They they won't believe because they can't believe because they don't have the truth in them. So there's these 
it's almost like scales over their eyes. They cannot see what's right in front of them. And in that instance, yeah, it was, it was like a spiritual thing. But then you have the part I think where Austin was talking about where, where Mary is speaking to him, and she's worried because they took Jesus' body away, and he has to say, he says to her, Mary, and she doesn't recognize him. And she says, oh, Lord. She says she notices it's him. You know, I think in that case it was also – and you know what? In, in defense of what Mitch was saying, that might have also been a disbelief issue. You know, it may have been a thing where Mary – was she really? She was looking for his body. She wasn't looking for him alive. She was looking for his body, expected to find his body. So she wasn't looking for him to be leaving and breathing and walking. Yeah. So, you know, and then her eyes were open. You know, so I, I think there's a lot good. of speculation there, but you, yeah, exactly. There's uh, these are things that we'll go into more detail in other chapters. But I, uh, I'll tell you, just I've I've always thought that J Jesus in the resurrected body was able to do uh, two things that. Um, appear in a room without going through a doorway and also not be recognized and then be recognized. So I think that he has the quality of being a shapeshifter. Like in science fiction, how you're a shapeshifter, you can change how you look. Uh, and then also what, uh, for you're able to uh, like beam me up, you know, your, your molecules are taken apart and you're transported to another location and the molecules are assembled. So if, if we're going to be able to do those things because our resurrected bodies are supposed to be like his, uh, maybe we'll be able to appear wherever we want and, and also change our appearance however we like. Uh, I don't know. I've always thought those things are, are you know, possible uh, explanations. Let's go to, uh, let's continue on with this point here uh, about will it be a new earth as far as one earth been re destroyed completely and one totally recreated or renewed. So is, the question is, will the earth we know come to an end? Yes. To a final end? No. Uh, Revelation 21.1 says, the old earth will pass away. Why don't you look, look it up if you don't mind, Eric? Revelation 21.1. Sure. Uh, but when people pass away, they do not cease to exist, as we will be raised to be new people, so the earth will be raised to be a new earth. Revelation, yeah. tw Revelation 21 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Okay. So um, he's asking the question uh, because it passed away, does that mean it didn't exist? You know, uh, when, when a, one of our loved ones passes away, they don't cease to exist, do they? They're, they're existing uh, in some other form. They're, the bodies are in the grave existing. Their, uh, their molecules, or physical molecules, are somewhere. Uh, their spirit is uh, either in, uh, in heaven or uh, uh, in uh, waiting for judgment uh, if they're lost. So uh, they still exist. So the, the earth, uh, even though it will be, uh, what's the word, pass away, doesn't mean that it doesn't exist any longer. So the question is asked, did Peter invent the notion of all things being restored? That's from uh, Acts 3.21 uh, when he says um, uh, Peter preached that Christ must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. So uh, did Peter invent the notion of all things being restored? No, he was not he not only learned it from the prophets, he heard it directly from Christ. When Peter, hoping for a commendation or reward, pointed out to Jesus that the disciples had everything left, uh, had left everything to follow him, the Lord didn't rebuke him. Instead, he said, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones and judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So, um, And he, the idea is uh, the, the word renewal is being used by the prophets in the Old Testament and also by Jesus himself. I have to renew my library card. I got a couple books. I got to. I remember when I was a kid. Uh, when I was a kid, and the, the the neighbor old neighborhood that we lived in, I, I thought it was a pretty nice neighborhood, but I just didn't know any better. But they had a project in the city called Urban Renewal. But they, they came in and destroyed the whole neighborhood and built a, a new neighborhood there. Uh, and uh, that's what the government called urban renewal. 
but they tore down the buildings and built new ones. Uh, that's, I think that's my oldest recollection of, of renewal, of something being renewed. So it's not like they, they tore it all down and that's how it was. No, there were buildings there. Now there's buildings there again. Well, the word renovate actually means make new again. Mm -hmm. Novate means new. So it's funny how he's talking about renewed and renovate. When you renovate something, you make it new. You renew it. Mm -hmm. It's funny. It's funny that Mitch used the library card. It's funny because yeah, you renew your library card, and what do you get? You get a new library card on an existing library account. Your account isn't new. It's the same account, but you get a new card. Right. Mm -hmm. exactly. So uh, Randy says, "Note uh, Christ's word choice. He did not say, quote." after the destruction of all things or after the abandonment of all things but he said at the re renewal of all things this is not a small semantic point it draws a line in the sand between two fundamentally different theologies mankind was designed to live on the earth to God's glory that's exactly what Christ's incarnation death and resurrection secured a renewed humanity upon, upon a renewed earth Jesus explicitly said all things would be renewed. So, I think that we've made the point pretty well enough that the earth is going to be renewed. It's not going to just be it's not going to be destroyed and abandoned. It's not going to be de destroyed and then something brand new, completely recreated. It's going to be destroyed in a way, or it's going to be. Uh, 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 it, he says, "What was it after the?" after the renewal of all things. He did not say after the destruction of all things. So that, that that's, a, I think, a pretty significant distinction. And then he says, um, in the movie The Passion of Christ, when Jesus is headed toward Calvary, on his knees under the weight of the cross, he says to his shocked and grief-torn mother, quote, Behold, I make all things new, unquote. Uh, these words are straight from Revelation 21.5, uh, where they're spoken by the risen Jesus concerning the new earth. I make all things new. Okay, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I'm, I read ahead enough to, to think that we, need, we can skip to uh, chapter 10 now. And that's, uh, chapter 10 would be uh, beginning of page 99. So this makes us about roughly 20% through, 20-25% through the whole book. Um, the question in this chapter is, um, what will it mean for the curse to be lifted? And he has a quote from Martin Lloyd-Jones. Anybody heard of Martin Lloyd-Jones? I haven't. Is the, is the curse he's referring to, is that sin, the sin nature? Mm-hmm. Well, the, the curse is, is the fallen state and death, I think. Right. But, but every, every, and it, it's the result of sin, but the right. curse is the result of sin. Sin is not the curse, but the result no, of... Uh, no, no, I'm just saying, like, you're entitled, you're entitled to sin nature and then death. Okay. All right, so he says, everything will be glorified, even nature itself. And that seems to me to be the biblical teaching about the eternal state, that what we... What we call heaven is life in this perfect world as God intended humanity to live it. When he put Adam in paradise at the beginning, Adam fell and all fell with him. But men and women are meant to live in the body and live and will live in a glorified body, in a glorified world, and God will be with them. So what will it mean for the curse to be lifted? Well, I guess... Uh, He's going to be discussing what the curse is, but what's your reaction, uh, Austin? What what did you say the curse is? The the sin type the entitled the sin nature that came from Adam one and one man and caused sin and because sin entered to the world. Um, hmm. I would always I guess if I was asked what was the curse, I would say the curse is not sin; it's the result of sin, and well, the curse. Yeah. The curse is is death, right? Uh, the death of the universe, the death of mankind, this uh, this entropy. But is not the sin nature a result a result of sin originally? Or? Yeah, so I'm saying that, that's an interesting point. Maybe we should add and include 
this sin nature as part of the curse because that's that was the result of sin. We all inherited this sin nature. Yeah, I, I think, think the curse has to define the, the the symptoms of all the problems, and that's Murphy's law down here is enough of the curse. Stubbing my toe is a curse. I mean, it's all like everything down here that goes wrong, having to make money and dealing with people, right. and dealing with with all think, the stuff. I, I think the word Luke used there was a good word, death. It does not just pertain to a physical death that when we die. It's the death of many things. It was death of our relationship with God. It was the death of um, it was the death of the way the world was supposed to be. It was the it was the death of it was the death of many things, not just our physical life and death that we go through, but but it, it was the death of many established things that God had originally put into place. I think the insects were fine until until the fall, and then all of a sudden mosquitoes started eating people. I mean, this is you know, I mean, the, oh, no, I happen, I happen world, to agree the with that. Creation. I happen to agree Earth. with that. Uh, you know, there was harmony amongst all living things, animal uh, animals. Uh, there was harmony to that, but it was the death of all that. Yeah. I wanted to touch on that. I No, I mean, I agree absolutely with that. I just wanted to say that I think uh, a big result of either, you know, man's corrupt, corrupt, corruption with the earth or something else, but I think Mother Nature has played a significant role in the effects and everything, I think, due to uh, that unharmony without, with nature and man. I think that we've changed it so much to where now we can see it before our eyes. Absolutely. Yeah, Mother Nature, absolutely. You know, she fell. With the I... Uh... I, I don't. Uh, I don't mean it as a criticism. It's just that for for me personally, I've never liked the term Mother Nature. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, because it's a worship, right? She yeah. It's it, butter, it, doesn't yeah. she? Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> right, I forgot. I'll just go with nature. Yeah, I remember that. Thing. Like, no, no, no. But point taken, though. I, I, no, I, I, I agree with what Luke was saying. Absolutely, I hate using that term. I don't like that term either. But, 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 yeah. I mean, we know you're not referring it as Mother Nature as an entity, and that's what Luke's yeah. point is making. It's not a good well, thing to equate I think it with. I'm, I'm probably unique on my opinion in this panel, and that I don't think nature was really affected by the fall. You don't see. I, I think it. I think it definitely was. I when think human was, beings were affected, but I think there was still entropy and and death among animals. Okay. See, this is uh, this is what I was talking about when you left a few minutes ago, uh, Jackson. You excuse yourself for a minute. Mm -hmm. I, I I called your name and wanted to ask you something or a you, and you weren't there, so I talked behind your back. Okay. So you, you can watch the video back and find out what I said. Or maybe okay. I could just repeat it right now and spoil the suspense. Okay. Okay, now, uh, if I remember correctly, you, you are not a young earther. You're an old earther. That's right. Okay. The prob one of the problems I see with old earth, besides some other things about, you know, the, the deterioration of the, the gravitational field and the ozone layers and that, those kinds of th uh, problems, but I, I see that if nature has been dying for, like, Let's say, uh, just give me a number. Uh, if we believe man was here for, say, seven thousand years, and then, uh, but uh, the Earth and and uh, other life was here long before that, as as you would with an old Earth uh, viewpoint, how many years should we go back? Uh, ten thousand, a hundred thousand, or a million, or whatever number? What what number would you want to use? For what? For how old I think the Earth is? And, and life. Other uh, life forms. Other life forms. You, you believe that man is is seven thousand years old, roughly? Um, you know, I tend to lean towards more like something like maybe a hundred thousand or something like that because of some gaps. You can read about that in um, oh, the gap theory. Well, I do. I I'm I I'm open to the gap theory, but right now I hold to the day age point of view. I think that each day in Genesis was actually a geologic age. Okay. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to divert too far into that topic. I just was saying that uh, when you say that um, the fall of man did not cause death for all creation, uh, then that would fall align with an older theory. But the problem with that is that uh, uh, I, I think this. I, well, the way I see the scripture stating is that, that there was no death until man sinned. And that was not just for man, but all animal life, all my life. Retort, my, my rebuttal to that is, 
I don't believe that anyone actually believes that all death and creation came through Adam's sin because it says I give you every green plant and a green plant is alive and when you eat it it's no longer alive. Um, yeah. So what you're saying is that you think both animal death and human death came through the fall, not yeah. death period because yeah. of the green plants and everything. Um, then, of course, you could get into more gray areas, like what about jellyfish that don't, bre don't bleed and everything. There's disagreement about young earth creationists even about insect life and everything. And the only way I can fully, I think, get a concrete explanation of death coming through sin is I do, unlike a theistic evolutionist, which let me clarify, I am not a theistic evolutionist, and unlike a theistic evolutionist, I believe that human death did come through the fall. I, don't, I believe the reason we die is because of Adam's sin. I don't believe that extends to animals any more than it extends to plants. And I've yet to have someone show me concrete evidence why there's a difference. Yeah. Well, I think your distinction there doesn't bother me. I mean, a lot of people would take serious issue with it and think think that it's a horrible um, viewpoint that you hold. Uh, but for me, I don't really have any problem with that. As long as we, as long as we still agree that man's death began because of the sin of, of Adam and Eve. Right, and that and that I definitely do believe. You know, Dr. Earl Rodmacher. If you, don't, I don't know if you know him or not, but he's a staunch grace advocate. He's been involved with GPS and everything. He holds the same view of creation that I do and everything, just so that everyone knows that this isn't some weird heretical cult out there or something. Well, you're, uh, I, I think it's more likely you will hold the same viewpoint as him rather than he holds the same viewpoint as you. Huh? <laughs> that was another attempt at humor, uh, Jackson, because you're younger than him. <laughs> oh, I don't. I, I don't see a difference between the two. Aren't they both just holding the same viewpoint, regardless of the order you put them in? <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. It's just another one of my failed attempts at humor, Jackson. So forgive me. Okay, let's go on here. Uh, all right. So we got to hear uh, Jackson's viewpoint on that. And unless someone wants to say something else about that, we'll move on. Yeah, really fast. I'm just looking into that today. I just weird the article. I stumbled across an article that explained a little bit of that. Uh, real fast, what? Uh, I don't even know what the view should be held on this. Do we hold true? Are we supposed to think it's six thousand years? Or are we supposed to think it's four billion? I'm not. What What are we supposed to even think? Of this? Well, let me let me say something here, Austin. I mean, very sincere Christians have disagreed on this issue. This is not at all one of the fundamentals of the faith. Oh, okay. Um. Some, like, like, okay, David J. Stewart actually is an old earther, but he does believe in a recent creation of man about 6,000 years ago. I, I, and t I believe in a relatively recent creation of man. I think a few artifacts and stuff in my research may, may be point to there being gaps in the genealogies a bit, but I, I don't believe man is ancient. I do believe the earth is ancient. Um, some believe it. There, 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 there's an old earth viewpoint that there was a gap between Genesis 1 and 2. I tend to take the viewpoint that the days are symbolic for a long period of time, and others believe there were 24 hours and there was no gap, and those would be the people who hold to a recent creation, a 6,000-year-old earth. Yeah. Right. I don't know how familiar everybody is with what Jackson's saying. I, I've studied everything he said. It's just that I don't have any real uh, strong arguments for any of those viewpoints. I mean, I have it. They're all. It's finding it interesting. Here's where I think that it is is the important uh, point that we uh, we um, acknowledge, uh, and that is that um, man was created as an intact being. We did not evolve from a lesser species. Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I think he was raptured again. Yeah, and it was with the glasses again. <laughs> Did he? <laughs> I knew you were going to point that out. There's got to be something he's doing. There has to be. <laughs> yeah. I just stumbled across this yesterday. It's cool. Well, it's a cool Hi. find. Oh, let's, there you go, well, Luke. Yeah, well, I got. Uh, yeah, I, got I, just, I think I, it's. I got sad. kicked off. Yeah. I got kicked off. I don't know. I got back pretty quickly. Is once I I had to sign in with my uh, password again. Uh, now I got an extra icon here, don't I? So let me get yeah. rid of that. Uh, eject. I got to eject myself. Just remember, I have the power to eject you at any time. I could cast you into outer darkness if I want to. Yeah. 
Careful, there's, oh, well, there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> All right. I'll be at my computer. Dang, God. Yeah. <laughs> the point, though... Austin is about about all all three of the views of creation I just mentioned view Genesis as a historic report of what how the creation happened. Okay. Some modern evangelicals think it's like an allegory or something or a parable, Adam and Eve and stuff. Whereas the gap theory, the day age theory, and the young earth view all believe it's a literal you know report of something that happened, which I think definitely most clearly fits yeah. with scripture yeah. also. Did you guys hear the the point I made before I got cut off? Or I want to make sure I didn't lose that point. And to me, the distinction is that we we acknowledge that God created man as an in, innate, an, an intact, completed uh, creature, mm-hmm. not as some lesser species that evolved over a period of time. And that would be, would be called theistic evolution. Uh, theistic uh, theistic evolution. Uh, then I I would have a serious problem with that. But if we, if God created man uh, as Adam and Eve in, in intact, complete human beings, um, in, not even from a birth, infancy, but just as adults, as it says in, in uh, Genesis, then I think that's the important thing to agree to. Uh, and, but if we say that man was originally some kind of a amoeba and became more and more advanced species, that's theistic evolution and. That's where I would have to draw the line and say, well, I, that's not acceptable. Right. What, um, the thing about the thing about that that view, the issue I have is it seems to, unlike the three other views, it compromises the narrative perspective. It says that then Genesis wasn't a narrative, and then of course you have to ask the question, when does it start becoming a narrative? The Bible and everything, and I, I'm always afraid of that slippery slope because I. Yeah. I I've, I have a book that says I love Jesus and accept evolution and stuff, and I've read it, and I've read it a lot and considered the theistic evolution viewpoint, and it kind of made me nervous for the same reason, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Well, what you've successfully done, Jackson, is you have just opened yourself uh, up for an attack from uh, who knows who, who decides they want to uh, uh, um, brand you some form of heretic. That was real fast when you cut out. I was going to say that I, I uh, somebody actually found this. I didn't, so I'm going to take the credit. But uh, Darwin actually had a grandfather. Uh, I'm not sure if his father was, but I know his grandfather was a master mason. And he made a thing that Darwin revised. And his grandfather made it something called something with nature. And it's actually Darwin that revised it to the evolution thing, and he passed it and everything. And then there's a selective system for survival of the fittest that he also had problems explaining. But he actually made a quote once. I'm not sure if he still holds true to it, but he says it's hard that I believe this fantasy that I've you know kind of like fabricated along for my grandfather. So I don't even think he believed his initial report on his evolution thing, but I think now since he's like the, the pope of atheists, I think he's just going to continue with the praise. But... He, he, I, I never knew that that it was actually started. The initial work was by his his grandpa, which was a, a, a master mason. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, let's uh, go on. The question in this chapter ten is, uh, what will it mean for the curse to be lifted? We've talked about what the curse is, given our own ideas on that. So it says. Um, When Adam and Eve fell into sin, Satan appeared to have ruined God's plan for a righteous, undying humanity to rule the earth to God's glory. Yet immediately after the fall, God promised a redeemer, the seed of the woman, who would one day come and crush the serpent. In Genesis 3.15 it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. I know the Catholics love that. Catholics love that? Yeah, the verse. They try to make it as, like, Mary on top of Satan. I, I remember that when I used to go to my catechism. They even had a picture. I think it's a famous Catholic picture. It's with Mary, and she's holding... I don't know if it's baby Jesus or an angel. I think it's Jesus. And she's like uh, on top of a horned being. Hmm. Well, um, 
we let's let's dismiss the Catholic viewpoint for a minute. What does this verse pertain to? Well, what happened in the fall? Man ate of this fruit, did he not? This fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And what did that what what did that bring us? A curse. So then when the Savior came, right, he took he did two things. He took the curse of the law away, but he also made us rivet our eyes or put us back under God, the authority of God. In other words, uh, no longer will man rebel or, 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 or anybody rebel as Satan did because now they realize the truth about their own works and, and now that we have Christ, we're under his blood and living under the grace of that tree, again, the tree, the tree of life again, renews and restores everything and and I, I think it's a beautiful picture of, of how how uh, it's almost like the prodigal son picture where we we fell away and we came back mm -hmm. well isn't this the first uh, indication in the scriptures of, of our redemption yes I believe it yes. is the first it's the first count of the of the record that the Messiah was going to come and going to <clears throat> and going to defeat uh, Satan's rule. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now he says it says while the wound of sin was still fresh before the first scar had formed, God unveiled His plan to send a fully human Redeemer who would be far more powerful than Satan in a courageous act of intervention to deliver mankind. This Redeemer would deliver a mortal wound to the usurping devil and in the process would be wounded himself. Um, when it says strike his heel, um, uh, strike his heel, uh, what, what is that uh, referring to? I do believe that that refers to, to, to uh, uh, Satan striking God on earth, or, st or striking the Messiah. And right, the f his physical, his physical harm, his physical death. His physical death on uh, down here. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So striking the heel, but comparing it to crushing your head, there's quite a contrast between these two uh, types of blows and and uh, results. The the crushing of the head is is just total dis destruction, and then the striking of the heel is a is a problem, but you recover from it. Right. What he, what Satan was going to do with him, right? What Satan was going to do to him was a, merely a wound. Yeah. What, what, what he would wind up doing eventually to Satan would be utter destroy, utter destroying him. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it, it says, "quote Since one of the results of sin had been death," writes Anthony Hokima, "quote The promised victory must somehow involve the removal of death. Further." Since another result of sin had been the banishment of our first parents from the Garden of Eden, from which they were supposed to rule the world for God, it would seem that the victory should also mean man's restoration to some kind of regained paradise, from which he could once again properly and sinlessly rule the earth. In a sense, therefore, the expectation of a new earth was already implicit in the promise of Genesis 3.15. Well, that's interesting because he's talking about these two things: uh, the uh, the problem of death being solved, and the problem of being banished from paradise. So I guess that's the result of the fall then, right? The fall means that we're banished from paradise and, and earth would no longer be paradise. So, you know, there's going to be weeds. There's going to be work, hard toil. Women will suffer in childbirth. All these things happen uh, because of the fall uh, and eventually death happens because of the fall. But when we're redeemed, our promise is we will not suffer death anymore, and we will not have this toil and hardship. It's going to be paradise as Adam and Eve had it originally. 
I think that uh, the the fall had a lot of a lot of implications is what we're what we're going through here, and it seems like it kind of seems like the heart of heaven and redemption and everything is the restoration of. I don't want to say reversal because that makes it sound like it'll that it never happened or something, but the fixing of the fall, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. the reparation of the fall and everything. And it seems like we just keep on coming back to that, and um, and that being and and that being sort of what the bottom line is with redemption. Mm -hmm. Not and that that's not to say that we're not individually responsible too, because we are and everything. But it's interesting we're individually responsible. A lot, a lot in part because we inherited the sin nature because of the fall and everything. So, so was it our fault that we were born sinful? <laughs> that that particular part may not have been our fault, but the fact that we ever chose to act on it was is our fault. Mm -hmm. so I'd say there's well, both will and non-will involved, as paradoxical as that may seem. Mm hmm. Okay, uh, taking our inheritance, our, our interest in the end times usually extends to the period immediately preceding and following the return of Christ, the return of Christ. But God's plan culminates after the final judgment when King Jesus says, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And that's Matthew chapter 25. Where is this kingdom? Exactly where it has been from the beginning, on earth. Um, I think this is a good, uh, point where I need to stop for uh, next time. This will give us a chance to kind of rehash anything we've covered and, and uh, close the show off. We're approaching the two-hour mark. Um, and then and if, if Eric gets his way, you, you guys will talk for four more hours. <laughs> We're gonna keep you up all night, Eric. You're yeah, there are, you know, there's other folks talking here. You know, yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. The problem is, uh, we, we limit the show, the live broadcast, to two hours, and then uh, you guys love Jesus and the Scripture so much that after the show, you just don't want to stop. I mean, it goes into the wee hours of the night for you guys on the East Coast. You just go on and on, and then you, you have to wake up the next morning and go to work, and you just, you know, you and just... You show, and you show great mercy by cutting this back to two hours so that the people don't have to listen to me ramble on for another yeah. another three hours once we go. I, I, I think one way of describing this, this problem here <laughs> is you guys have some kind of an addiction to Jesus. <laughs> Well, you know, think about it like this. It's a little bit like having a godly version of a hangover going with you to this all night. This should, be, this should be called a hangover. Oh, why do I feel hangover. like this? This godly hangover. <laughs> a godly <laughs> hangover. Instead of a hangout, it's a hangover. <laughs> right. Yeah, I was reminding Mitch, I mean, Eric, earlier, I said, you know, you you're the one that complained to me that you couldn't talk after the show for hours because you had to work the next morning. So we moved the time for the show up an hour earlier to accommodate you, and then the very next time you want to talk for four hours after the show's over. Yeah, I know. It's, uh... So anybody watching this video, there's all kinds of uh, interesting conversations we've had that you are not privy to. These are <laughs> private conversations among the panelists, and that, that some of the most interesting talks we've had have been after the broadcast ends. Okay, let's get back on topic here. Um, anything that we've brought up today that uh, uh, sticks out to you that you want to kind of uh, uh, explain or emphasize uh, before we finish? Just that heaven is a real place, a place, a tangent place, but not a tangent place that's that's fallen or broken or anything like the problems we have in this world today where people get along and there's harmony I, I really believe that there, that there will be much enjoyment up there um, and I think that, 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 that the reason why we need to go through this earth is to appreciate what we get but many people don't have a vision for what we're gonna get because they, they don't, they, don't they, they see it as, as not a place where we're going to enjoy things we're just gonna be some nebulous floating cloud Mm -hmm. 
Well, this uh, today's topic was really about the question of uh, the. Um, we know that there's a necessity for the resurrection and restoration of mankind, of our humanity, but uh, now there's also a necessity for a kind of resurrection, a renewal of the earth itself and the whole universe. So the earth is going to be restored and renewed, uh, and then we know that eventually what's going to happen is God's going to put his capital city, the New Jerusalem, right here on the earth, uh, and earth and God will live with us on the earth. Uh, so that's the area where we're really beginning to discuss right now. And uh, I like to ask this question. Uh, I asked it a lot of times already, but I just I'm I'm just dumbfounded by the typical Christian's ignorance of, of all this. Uh, the idea that uh, uh, it, in eternity we're going to be living on earth with God. Heaven will come down and join earth. Uh, and earth and heaven will be united again, and uh, this earth is going to be like where our body is going to be resurrected. Well, the earth itself will basically be resurrected or renewed and restored into a, into paradise. Well, I think that there should be holy holy speakeasies up there. I mean, seriously, bars and restaurants and whatnot will be holy things. It will be. That's what I'm saying. That, that, that it will be new. It will. It, it will be. It will be different than the fallen way it is. Drinking I, up there will be good. Yeah, I think, brother Mitch, you, what you keep emphasizing uh, every show you like to bring this topic up. I think you're going to be in eternity. You're going to be in the spirit business. Absolutely, I'll be selling the spirit. Yeah, got it. He'll be but the you know board. what? When you go up there, you buy for nothing, so I have to give it out for free. <laughs> Oh, that'll be a lot of holy hangovers. <laughs> right. Oh yeah. Now I, you know, Luke, based on what you were saying, I said this before. I'm going to say it again. I, th I think Christians in in that issue that you brought up with this, with this not being talked about, I think Christians are the largest part of the problem, and they can be some of the people being the part of the problem. It's getting in the way of a lot of people believing. Because when we make something like the idea of heaven, which is your future, the idea of heaven and earth being renewed, the idea of eternity, when we make that idea ridiculous, then to people who don't believe, it's ridiculous to them. They don't want to believe in it because we're we, we're not discussing it as a very real, like like Mitch said, like a tangent, a tangible place that they can really relate to. That they that they can see as yeah I can see that it's we tend Christians have been making heaven a very ridiculous place or, or or so obscure that there's no clear definition they don't discuss a clear definition of what it is why would people who don't believe really care I mean if this is how it's delivered to you I mean if if somebody for instance if there was a um a new movie coming out or something and somebody came you know came to me as a friend and said oh there's this new movie you got to see it and i said well what's it about well i don't know it's it's kind of like it's i don't know you won't really understand it it's not I mean, <laughs> would i want to go see that movie i mean i wouldn't want to see it if if i or, or they say you know or the or the, by their actions or by what they say the, the movie sounds so ridiculous i would say to them okay and why do you want me to go watch this it's you 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 think it's ridiculous but you want me to watch it? Why would I want to do that? I wonder how many people Whereas, have been held back from believing because of Christians making heaven to be something not as real as it is. Yeah. Well, I'm. Um, I let me uh, give everybody an opportunity here to to make their final point here uh, uh, regarding what we discussed today. Uh, Jackson, you were going to say something next. <laughs> I was just being. Uh, Semi facetious, although semi serious. When I said I love ridiculous movies, <laughs> and that's see. <laughs> see now, now Jackson, I I I guess I just totally misunderstood you because I thought you had no concept of humor. That's not true. Every he every takes time, literally. Yeah, every Ooh. time every time I try to say something in my attempt to be funny, uh, you pose come back with some very serious. Yeah, because I, I don't understand that humor. I understand but, the humor of j killer piranhas and giant squids. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's that you have humor. You have a sense of humor, but it's just it's doesn't. Uh, in my yeah. mind is my humor is not complimentary to or uh, understandable, comprehensible to you. 
Well, if you were to say to me when I was younger, you have a frog in your throat, I would actually picture a frog jumping out of my throat. <laughs> that's what I have. That's what I thought when I was younger, too. See, yeah. Mitch understands. Yes. Okay. Uh, all right, uh, Brother Mitch, what, what's your uh, final remarks here? You know what? Have a vision for heaven and have a vision for the Savior. This place is real, and Jesus can, Jesus can bring you there. So I, I, would, I would say that look to him, look to Christ, and, and, and believe on him. Because although many things are too good to be true on this earth, there is something that is good enough or better than, 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 than life. And most of Christianity doesn't tell you this good news. And so I would say trust in the Savior. Look into Christ. You'll find a lot more than what you ever, ever imagined. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, how about uh, Austin? Yeah, uh, you know, this is an excellent study, and it's it's so sad that, you know, before this even hangout, I've never even heard anybody else ever have a discussion remotely around uh, heaven, so it's, you know, it's nice that we have this so lengthy, because, you know, it's all profitable. But mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to put out that uh, I have a few verses for, uh, I found this out, I thought it was a pretty cool find. It was the, the six days and then the seventh. You know, you have the six days God worked and then the seventh he rested. Well, uh, I, when I was away from uh, YouTube for a little bit, I noticed that there's a lot of uh, new push for uh, the, you know, attack on the faith alone. And, and it, you know, it always is. But now they're saying that faith is a work and everything. And, you know, it's a gift from God, Ephesians 2 8. But I know that this was a cool thing that I noticed that that fits in. It's the six days man's working and their works won't profit them. And you go Old Testament and go Isaiah 57 12 it says, I will declare thy righteousness and thy works for they not profit thee. So man's works won't profit them. But then the seventh day Christ rests, God's rest. And then I remembered uh, Brother Luke loves this verse. I love it too. It's great. Romans 10 3 through 4 it says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and not going about to and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is a really cool faith alone kind of uh, thing. But yeah, heaven is a wonderful place. Uh, it's something that needs to be talked about every day if it could, but more frequently would be best. But uh, yeah, wonderful mm -hmm. teaching, Miss Brother Luke. Okay, good. And let me see, uh, Eric, did you make any final remarks? Yeah, I think uh, I had already said, basically. All right. Uh, so the, the topic, well, this is episode number seven. So I guess now we've talked for 14 hours about heaven. And some people could be shocked and amazed that we could talk even for an hour or two about heaven. Uh, and yet, after 14 hours we've really scratched the surface. There's so much more and I'm really looking forward to it. I hope that if you watched any of these videos you get hooked on them and you want to learn everything about heaven uh, and it'll just give you great hope and joy for your future. Uh, but uh, telling you how wonderful heaven is uh, will do you no good if you don't know how to get there. So uh, I want to ask uh, can, can anybody on the panel tell the audience uh, what do they have to do? What? Uh, how do they get get into heaven? You know, one of the coolest things about heaven is just how simple it is to get there. You know, the gospel is Jesus Christ was God's perfect Son and God in the flesh, and was sent to Earth, and He died on the cross for our sins. He was nailed to the cross. He was buried, and then He rose again three days later and offers this gift of eternal life that's completely paid for by his blood just to those who simply believe on him for it. It's not about stopping sins, it's not about doing good works, it's not about any of that, it's simply about fully trusting in the finished work of the cross that he did on your account. And anyone who does that is eternally secure and will be saved forevermore. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Yeah, thank you, brother. That was very well stated, and uh, uh, really the, the idea that uh, it's simple, salvation, 
Eternal life in heaven is a gift, and it's simple and easy. These are the two things you have to get in your head. The, the simplicity of putting your faith in the Savior. Um, the Savior is named Jesus Christ. He's God himself. And he loves us so much that he was willing to become a man and die for our sins. And he raised himself from the dead, proving he's God, proving his, the power to give you life everlasting in heaven. So that, that's simple and, 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 and easy in that uh, God doesn't require you to work for it or earn it or, you, or buy it somehow by giving money to charities or tithing to churches. No, there, there's... It's so easy. All you've got to do is receive it from the Savior. He's, he's reaching out his hand right now, offering you eternal life. And once you reject every other way and say, Jesus is the way, I'm going to trust him completely, he gives you eternal life then. So it's simple, and it's easy, and it's a free gift God has for you right now. If you receive it, let us know. We want to celebrate, and so put a comment uh, in the comments section of this video. I want to thank all the panelists uh, for participating again. Uh, this means a lot to me to have you here. And uh, if you're watching the video, uh, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. Every Sunday and Wednesday, 4 p.m. Pacific time. Okay, I'll end the broadcast now. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ. <laughs>